Write an indirect proof. This is Lesson 5.5a. We're up to nine previous videos for Chapter 5 that talks all about properties and attributes of triangles. If you've missed any, go to the Geometry Playlist that's linked to this video. So far, we've written proofs using direct reasoning. We began with the true hypothesis and built a logical argument to show that a conclusion was true. In an indirect proof, we begin by assuming that the conclusion is false. Then we show that this assumption leads to a contradiction. And this type of proof is also called a proof by contradiction. So for writing an indirect proof, the first thing we do is identify the conjecture. You know, that's the statement believed to be true, to be proven. So we identify the conjecture to be proven. Number two, we assume the opposite. The negation of the conclusion is true. Number three, we use direct reasoning to show that the assumption leads to a contradiction. Number four, we conclude that since the assumption is false, the original conjecture must be true. So, little yellow hand, this should be written down, okay? When writing an indirect proof, look for a contradiction of the given information, a definition, a postulate, a theorem. And problems containing the word not are good candidates for an indirect proof. So we can write an indirect proof that a right triangle can't have an obtuse angle. First thing we do is we identify the conjecture to be proven. Well, it's given that triangle ABC is a right triangle, and we can see the little corner here. It's telling us it's a right triangle. We need to prove that triangle ABC does not have an obtuse angle. Number two, we assume the opposite of the conclusion, the proof. So if it says to prove that it does not have an obtuse angle, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to prove it does have an obtuse angle, okay? So we're going to assume triangle ABC has an obtuse angle, and we're going to let B be obtuse, all right? We're just going to assume it's obtuse. Number three, we use direct reasoning to lead to a contradiction. So if this is 90 degrees, we know because of the triangle sum theorem that B plus C must also be 90 degrees, so the whole thing will equal 180 degrees, right? So the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C is going to equal 90 degrees because the acute angles of a right triangle are complementary. We know that's 90, right? If they've got to be 180, then these two must be 90. So the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C is equal to 90 degrees. The acute angles of a right triangle are complementary. And the measure of angle B is equal to that 90 degrees minus this measure of angle C. That's the subtraction property of equality. And the measure of angle B is greater than 90 degrees because that would be the definition of an obtuse angle. So we're assuming that's obtuse, right? So it has to be greater than 90. And we can substitute this 90 minus measure of angle C because it equals B for B. So we put 90 degrees minus the measure of angle C is greater than 90 degrees. When we subtract 90 from each side of the inequality sign, we end up with a negative measure of angle C is greater than zero. Well, measures can't be negative. And by the protractor postulate, a triangle cannot have an angle measure less than zero. We conclude that the original conjecture is true, that triangle ABC does not have an obtuse angle. The assumption that triangle ABC has an obtuse angle is false. Therefore, triangle ABC does not have an obtuse angle. Okay? And the positions of the longest and shortest sides of a triangle are related to the positions of the longest and largest and smallest angles. So here's the angle side relationships theorem in triangles. So we have 5.5.1 and 5.5.2. This one says if two sides of a triangle are not congruent, then the larger angle is opposite the longer side. In the proof, we can write in and the triangle larger and then the angle symbol is op period longer side, okay? So AB is greater than BC. And the measure of angle C is greater than the measure of angle A. So because this is greater, this side is longer. Because this side is longer, that's greater, okay? If two angles of a triangle are not congruent, 
then the longer side is opposite the larger angle. Just what we were saying up here, okay? But now we're doing angles instead of sides, okay? And in a proof, you'd write in and then a triangle. Longer side is op, period, larger, and then the angle symbol. So the measure of angle Z, this pink one, is greater than the measure of angle Y, the blue one. XY is greater than XZ. It's opposite the larger angle, see? Now, don't assume the opposite of the given statement. That's not what we do. We use the prove statement. Carefully review what should be assumed when writing an indirect proof. So here's an example of indirect proof. When Tala walks home from school, she wonders if her father is home. He always parks his car in the driveway. And the driveway is empty, so she concludes that her father isn't home yet. Tala used indirect reasoning to reach her conclusion without going inside to see if he's home. If she had used direct reasoning, she would have gone in to see if he was home. She used his car as the basis of her reasoning, so that was indirect reasoning, okay? Using theorem 5.5.2, this one that says, if two angles of a triangle are not congruent, then the longer side is opposite the larger angle. So here it's given that the measure of angle P is greater than the measure of angle R, and we need to prove that the blue QR is greater than the red QP. So here's our indirect proof. We're going to assume that blue QR is not greater than red QP. This means that it's either less than QP or it's equal to QP. So for case one, we're going to do the less than if QR, the blue one, is less than QP, the red one, then the measure of angle P is less than the measure of angle R because the larger angle is opposite the longer side. So that wouldn't be able to be the longer side if that wasn't the larger angle, see? So if it's smaller than R, it can't be. And this contradicts the given information that it's larger, see? So QR is not less than QP. So here's case two, we're gonna use the equal. If QR is equal to QP, well then the measure of angle P is equal to the measure of angle R by the isosceles triangle theorem. And this also contradicts the given information that P is larger than R. It's saying it's equal, so QR is greater than QP. And the assumption QR is not greater than QP is false. Therefore, QR is greater than QP. And be careful, we consider all cases when we assume the opposite. If the conclusion is that QR is greater than QP, like we've got, the negation is going to include that it is less than and that it is equal to it, okay? So those would be our cases, all right? We can order and write triangle side lengths and angle measures. Writing the angles in order from smallest to largest, so we're going to do angles, we don't have any angle measures, do we? We only have side lengths. Well, the short side is GJ right here, this red line. So the smallest angle is H, the one across from it, the one opposite of it, see? And the longest side is HJ, and according to theorem 5.5.2, that longer side is across from the larger angle. So we know angle G is the largest. And the angles from smallest to largest are angle H, then angle J, and then L angle G, okay? So even though we didn't have the angle measures, we were able to use a theorem to help us, okay? Here's writing the sides in order from shortest to longest. Now, we don't have any side lengths. We only have angle measures. So here we have angle M. We have KLM for our triangle. Well, the measure of angle M is equal to 180 degrees for the whole thing minus the measure of angle L, 39 degrees, plus this 54 degrees. If we add L and K together and get a sum and subtract that from 180, we'll know what M is, won't we? And it's telling us that it equals 87 degrees. That's the triangle sum theorem. It has to total 180 degrees, right? And the smallest angle is angle L. It's 39 degrees. So the shortest side is KM, this one, that is opposite the smallest angle. And the largest angle is M, so the longest side is KL. That's theorem 5.5.1, the one we did over here that says two sides of a triangle are not congruent, then the larger angle is opposite the large, longer side, okay? So we know that that's the largest, 
longest side, okay? And the sides from shortest to longest are KM, then LM, and then KL, okay? So I want to show you this really quick. This is what we're going to talk about in the next video. A triangle is formed by three segments, right? But not every set of three segments can form a triangle. So I've got six segments here. And we can take these segments and slide them and make a triangle. See? I've got the triangle inside here. I can also do it with these. I can slide this one up here. I can slide this to here and this to here. And we can make a triangle. See? What happens if I try moving this long side over here? Can we make a triangle? Yeah, it won't reach. And even if we lay it down really, really low, it's never going to reach. See? Even if they're laying flat, they're never going to reach. So we're going to talk about that in the next video, okay? So remember a conditional statement is logically equivalent to its contrapositive. If that confuses you, you need to go back to Chapter 2 and watch 2.2b. Okay, so our next lesson is Triangle Inequality Theorem 5.5b, and we'll talk about the sides of triangles and how some segments will not form a triangle, and some will, all right? I know this was a lot of information. I hope you took good notes, and keep your chin up. I believe in you, and I'll see you next time. Hit that like button for me. Bye.